You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you a little bit about our current sponsors, uh, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. As you well know, if you've been following This is Oklahoma, they've been a huge part of this podcast. So this podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram. Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Also, for the podcast, a new sponsor this year that's just come on board and super excited to announce RCB Bank. Since 1936, RCB Bank has offered progressive products and a friendly service. Come in today to find out more about their loan promotion on new used refinance cars, boats, campers, and ATVs. Visit RCB Bank to learn more. RCB Bank, that's my bank. With approved credit, restrictions apply. Now, let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode up at Circle Cinema today. If you're watching the video, which you should be, uh, the background is sick, very sick. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and sat in some, I guess, movie theater chairs and at a movie theater, which is awesome. But my guest today is uh, Dylan Brody. I'm excited to dive into just the movie stuff that he does. And, and as we know, you know, the state's been been kind of in the news really with with the movie business and and it coming you know with with the flower moon movie and you can tell how much i know about this obviously um but yeah i'm excited to talk about uh, i really appreciate you coming on the podcast uh dylan um you just said something before we started recording that the seat that one of us is in right now or maybe the one between us you sat and seen how many movies in Oh, it's it's the seat between us here, um, and we didn't sit in it in honor of it. Uh, I've seen probably at least 300 movies in this very chair yeah. here over the years. The Circle, I've been coming here for like uh, at least 15 years or so. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite places in Tulsa, maybe the world. That's awesome. So uh, before we do dive into current movie stuff, tell me a little bit about you, where you grew up, you know, and, and I guess early life. Well, uh, I am... Uh, Born and raised in Oklahoma. I'm, uh, if, if you know Oklahoma, uh, up towards Bartersville, where mm-hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be sort of based in, uh, I am from a tiny little town as you head that way called Ramona. Uh, 500 people, no stoplights. Uh, it's a town uh, that will make you a dreamer. And uh, that is the, the town that shaped me. And uh, movies were always the dream, but mm-hmm. it wasn't really possible back at the time as I was coming out of, of college. So I kind of went a different route into the film industry. But I still continued my passion. And then in the, uh, I started really starting to get my foot in the door and realize that things could change around uh, 2008 is mm-hmm. whenever I really uh, started pursuing it actively. And just had to toil in obscurity for years, just grind out a resume to really start to be able to impress people. Mm-hmm. And then just starting being able to get onto sets and then just never stop working, yeah. never stop trying to impress people to just show them what you're worth and just keep working harder and harder. Yeah, and yeah. That's how you keep getting hired. And that's kind of the key. Well, so the hard work that was instilled in you from a young age, was that through family? Was that through just a key figure? Or was that just kind of, you knew that that's what I've got to do to succeed? Uh, a little from column A, a little from column B. It uh-huh. de- uh, definitely came from my parents. They're both uh, incredibly hardworking people uh, that just work their fingers to the bone to make uh, a better life for my sister and myself. Mm-hmm. But it also came from the the knowledge that I couldn't just hope to have something handed to me. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to work if you want to succeed. Yeah, very true. Uh, and in a competitive industry that you're in, I'm sure it's, you know, you see it every day. Uh, so, so growing up, what gets you into, you know, like film and, and just the stuff that you're in, you know, like the technology side of things, how, how, how do you get introduced to that? Uh, just my love of film came from my mom. Uh, my mom is a, an enormous uh, film fan. We came to the circle a thousand times. Mm-hmm. The people here that uh, that run the circle also know my mom as well because she's seen not quite as many, many movies here as uh, I have, but she's seen quite a few here. Uh, so it, the love came from her and then just an com- entire wide range of mm-hmm. cinema. We didn't just have one thing that we settled on. But one thing that we particularly loved was indie films that you can see here mm-hmm. at Circle Cinema, one of the ba- best places to see. And that it just always just drove the passion and just wanting to be in that world world but 
it was just always so far you just couldn't reach it. Yeah. And then just getting into the industry made it a little bit more tangible. And then just keep on, keep yeah. on pushing, keep on just reaching for that goal. And it's incredibly hard work, but it is so rewarding to be able to to give back to what I was able to enjoy so much as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you start kind of making home movies as a kid and, and get in that way? And, like, what are you doing in high school and then, I guess, into college as well? Uh, actually, uh, no, I didn't really have any of the the technology available to me back as uh, in my youth to do that. It was more dreams, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, I was, believe it or not, a computer science major back in the day. So I had a little bit of an animation background, mm -hmm. and I thought that, that is where I would be able to tell my stories uh, but as the sort of the DSLR revolution started to happen I realized like oh I don't have to wait hours and hours for a single frame to re yeah. render I can do this myself and then uh, working with a couple of my friends you know we had you know, DSLR a little bit of lights we were able to start kind of grinding out our way in you know the documentary world and uh Actually, post-production is where I first got my foot in the door, it was uh, cutting together uh, documentaries. Okay. And one of them made a nice little splash onto the film festival circuit. And we, we kind of went around a little bit around the United States with it. And that was had me hooked forever. Yeah. What documentary was that? Uh, it was called Sinking Bobo. Okay. It uh, was a, a short film uh, about a dunk tank clown. And... Uh, his look on life and him harassing people along the carnival fairways. <laughs> sounds awesome. It kind of is. Yeah. I hate clowns, but it sounds awesome. Like my, my nightmares have the it clown in it for sure. And my wife loves scary movies as well, but not a huge fan of clowns, it, but just, I'm sure just, it was funny. Just the look of our clown. Uh, he's missing his front teeth from a fight. Uh, he has this just guttural, just bone chilling, uh, laugh and voice that he taunts people with. Uh, he's still doing it to yeah. this day. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Memories. So, uh, where did you go to be a computer science major? Uh, I went to, uh, Bartersville, uh, oh, okay. uh, uh mm -hmm. Oklahoma Wesleyan there. Nice. I, I went to Southern Nazarene, so oh, we're in played small a, world. yeah small world. We played a lot of uh, golf against <laughs> against you guys. Uh, so so you get your foot in the door with this you know this documentary, and, and you see I guess you're hooked then from mm -hmm. from then on, right? You're like Correct. now what? Like what's next? Everything's possible. You're like where do I go next? Mm -hmm. uh, you know what's that like? What time is that? And then and, and you know what's that journey? So that, let's see here. That's roughly uh, 2008 at this point. Uh, and at this point in Oklahoma film, mm -hmm. like, uh, a lot of the movies are really happening in the Oklahoma City area. And Tulsa, there's not a great deal of films currently happening at that time. So it's a little bit more commercial based with just a little bit of film. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of like an underground uh community of people, you know, say, trying to make documentaries, videography, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that, at that point in time, it was me working with some other folks uh, on the smaller end, just honing our skills, yeah. just... And there's it's a little, a little bit of dreaming as sure. well, because you just... There's the opportunities were different than they are like right now. We can talk about this later, but folks right now, you can get your foot in the door real quick now, and it's, mm -hmm. it's an absolutely beautiful thing, but it was a lot of grinding back then. And so uh, it was toiling in obscurity until about 2012. We had a lot of grinding every day, just trying to, to you know, get the foot in the door. And then in 2012, I had enough of a resume for a, a little horror film mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Gorgeous Vortex. It was a... Uh, one piece of an anthology in uh, the VHS series. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that uh, on that short, I quite literally worked my butt off as a truck PA. I lost uh, 15 pounds in blistering heat, getting just tons of junk on and off that truck every single day uh, for just... Yeah, this is a, alcohol might be have to be involved to tell all of these <laughs> stories, but it was quite an adventure. Um, and I, uh, one of the department heads on it, uh, I imp impressed them with just my work ethic, mm -hmm. and they said, Dylan, uh, I, I really like your hustle on set. Would you like to come out to LA with me and uh, work on some movies there? Yeah, and so I went out to LA and. Um, Worked on and got my foot in the door on some uh, larger projects like uh, Incarnate uh, Blumhouse production and uh, kind of read scripts for a production company and learned a lot of the tricks that I have today. Mm -hmm. I learned in Los Angeles. Yeah, 
So it's like the golden ticket, right? It, it, You're like, let's go. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going. It kind right? of was. It yeah. kind of was. And I was out there for a little, around a year, uh, and hadn't seen my family and uh, just mm-hmm. and wanted to come back and uh, just to see everyone. And then work just kept coming to me here after yeah. that. And um, I uh, never really had to go back after yeah, that. Yeah, I've, yeah. Uh, there were times where in Oklahoma got a little slow and I'd work in parts beyond, but honestly, the, that's kind of around the time when the film industry in Oklahoma just really started blowing up. Yeah. And it's, it's been a blessing to just really work continually uh, since then. Tell me about like the stuff that you were working on then in LA. Because so you, so you leave this, you know small town in Oklahoma, you get the golden mm-hmm. ticket, you go to LA, in around 08 time. Um, what I mean, is it like mm-hmm. driving into LA just like wow I'm here? Kind of like how is that experience? Because me when I go to LA I'm scared. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> I'm like it. Ah, you know? This was, oh man, uh, time uh, time is folding over like a burrito on me now, especially because of quarantine. But this is roughly 2012 okay. is when this is. Um, and just the, it's a 23-hour drive. Yeah. You're driving out there all by yourself. Uh, space madness sets in. It's like you're in a, a, just a space capsule with sure. no other people in the world. You know, your cell service is dead. It's, it's kind of... Um, Mind numbing, but the closer and closer you get to LA, just this this giddiness kicks in of just possibility, mm-hmm. and it is it is vastly overwhelming uh, because you get there and it's one of the most trite subjects you can talk about, especially in relation to Los Angeles, but like the traffic alone, the, yeah. the and a special thanks to my mom for teaching me how to be a, a very aggressive driver. So that, <laughs> that, that treated me very well in yes. Los Angeles and to know how to parallel park as well. So yes. any people planning on making their venture out to LA, practice your driving, please. And so it, it was really just a uh, an eye-opening experience just to be in somewhere so much bigger. Because mm-hmm. I, I had lived in Tulsa for years uh, before I had moved out there, but you know, to be from a town of 500 people yeah. to go to Los Angeles, people quite literally don't believe that a town that small can exist. Right. People thought that I was lying. saying like, you don't come from a town of 500 people. You yeah. just can't do that. This is, this is, a, this is a city. So uh, there, um, the main kind of projects I, I worked on were like, my favorite is Incarnate that I was mm-hmm. on. Um, it was a low-budget Blumhouse, uh, like the people that did Paranormal Activity, The Purge, mm-hmm. uh, those type of films. It was just a um, run-of-the-mill exorcism horror movie starring um, Aaron Eckhart and Carice Van Houten from mm-hmm. uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. And it... It was just really eye-opening to see how a big movie set worked, and then just to see all the moving parts. You know, like and as I've uh, matured in my career, I realized it, it was an absolutely tiny movie set in terms of budget. <laughs> right. You know, it was roughly, uh, I think it was a, uh, I think it was almost nine five million. Yeah. Whereas but compared like, to where you've come from, it was huge. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and then like Flower Moon, you're gonna have like a roughly two hundred million dollar movie yeah. uh, here. So it's it was very small on the chain, but there. It, it just seemed like I was uh, I was working on King mm-hmm. Kong or something, yeah. and so I was a and I just devoured every single second of it. I didn't matter what department I was watching do something. Yeah. I was just trying to learn every lesson and listen. Uh, just creep on the walkie-talkie every single moment of the day and just yeah. see what I could learn, and and that's just where I knew my passion was reinforced and everything that just didn't seem attainable for so long whenever mm-hmm. I was growing up was finally becoming something that I could achieve. Yeah. And that also instilled in me the will to just keep working harder sure. because there, there are people, and this is something that I tell you know, production assistants that are coming, coming up in the world. You know, there are people in this world that are going to be better connected mm-hmm. than you. They're going to have uh, you know, a, a wonderful education background. Uh, they'll have money that they can fall back on, you know, family money or whatever. They hit the lottery. It's just yeah. There are going to be people They're that, born and raised in L.A. Ex- this is, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There, there are going to be people in this world that you feel like they're going to be able to outclass you at every turn. But the thing that will always be true is those people can never outwork you. Mm -hmm. Your work ethic can always be better than the person that you feel is so much better connected than you. And so that is what will keep getting you hired, is doing a good job and not being 
let's let's be honest. Don't be a terrible person. Yeah. Try try to be kind. Try to be giving, mm-hmm. uh, but not to the point to where that will wear on you mentally. Because sure. your mental health is important. Everyone listening. So, but yeah. it's your your work ethic is going to be what keeps getting you hired. Mm-hmm. So uh, at this point, when when you're like you know you're, you're just soaking up everything that you mm-hmm. that you see and departments that you're in, are you kind of figuring out what like avenue you want to go down, like what niche you want to go down and see this is this is what I want to do. This is definitely what I don't want to do. Like, oh, um, absolutely. That yeah. and that is something that I definitely want to uh, reinforce to up and coming filmmakers. Here is uh, Oklahoma is a lot different than a larger market, very saturated market like New York, Los Angeles, uh, Georgia. If in in Los Angeles, I was uh, I was a production assistant mm-hmm. slash the assistant of my my mentor, uh, and I was able to see all the different departments at play. But generally in Los Angeles, a lot of people fall into this trap where it's just like I got hired to do this one thing once, so this is what I'm going to be forever. It's like I got to be a grip once. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people that help uh, you know yeah. set up the mm-hmm. lighting, and so I I'm, I'm a grip forever now because that's what I got hired to be. But in Oklahoma, it's the the film scene here is uh, is much more forgiving, and you get to kind of gravitate towards what you like. Yeah, yeah. So like, you get to try to be a grip. Uh, you know, it's starting out. You get to maybe uh, you know be a PA and maybe help out the grips or the cameras. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you move further up uh, on the film size, is uh, that you know the union minutia will complicate that a little bit. But on smaller projects, especially where everyone's going to be cutting their teeth, yeah. you really can help discover what you're you're passionate about. And at that time. I I knew that I wanted to be in the film industry, but I didn't exactly know what I was going to sure. be doing at that point. So it was really just getting experience at that point. It wasn't until later on in my career that it really started to crystallize that okay. how much I loved the minutia, uh, and that led me more towards my passion for producing, production managing, and then uh, occasionally location managing uh, as well, because they all sort of flow into each other as just these grand. Uh, tactical minutia yeah. related departments okay so you know talking about oklahoma and and just you know the scene here compared to the scene in la if everybody i mean anyone listening has probably seen a news article or a tweet or whatever it's talk that's saying that you know oklahoma's film industry is now a thing mm-hmm. um and it, it definitely is but it has been for a long time, right? There's been people mm-hmm. been making movies here for a long time, oh, but absolutely. to the average Oklahoman reader, news or whatever, they're probably like, oh, it's only been the last six months. You know, mm-hmm. well, it hasn't. Uh, what, is that, what was that like for you to come home and work ho- at home on projects? And, you know, I think they've been shooting the Kurt Warner story mm-hmm. recently and, and the Dennis Quaid one that was in Guthrie recently as well. Uh, Reagan. Uh, Reagan, yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously you have Matt and Rachel who are bringing or brought Prairie, Prairie, Stu- Prairie Surf, you know, Studios or whatever mm-hmm. to, to the Correct. Cox Convention Center, and they've been on before. But this is all kind of recent. Like, wh- when did you come back, and, and what was that like coming back to work on projects? This is uh, in my my fuzzy memory right now. This is roughly 2013-ish at uh-huh. this point in time. Um, and it was so just refreshing to really be welcomed into the circles now that I wasn't really in before yeah. I had left because it was you know a hard fought battle to try to get to that point and then now to start getting the calls to, mm-hmm. to start working on these projects and to knew, know that there was perpetual work happening was just was honestly it was mind blowing yeah. uh, you know I knew like August Osage County was before I had left was kind of the the thing that I'm not going to say it was disappointing, but it was just there was that wish. It was like August, August Osage County, August Osage County was happening almost practically in my backyard. Yeah. Like I could almost wave and say hello to them, but you know I, I wasn't able to get on that. So um, to know that I could be able to start to get on to projects of that caliber was was wonderful, and, and that was also another another sort of thing that crystallized my my work ethic. Was yeah. To like, yeah. You know, this is what you're really wanting to move towards. And so for the folks who think that Oklahoma film is just a recent blip, uh, Oklahoma is completely on the rise and continuing to grow. And uh, I'm sure some folks listening to this have heard me talk about it before, but Oklahoma is really 
catching the eyes of producers here and abroad mm -hmm. because just for example just let's use the metric of Sundance uh, and four years in a row uh, a film that has been shot in Oklahoma has premiered in the US uh, dramatic competition at Sundance mm. it was originally wildlife and then the next year it was to the stars and then it was our film Minari and we won the uh, the audience award and then the yeah. grand jury award at Sundance and then just this last uh, Sundance it was wild Indian Indian as well. So that is for a, a, a state that isn't known as like a New York, Los Angeles, a Georgia, that is, I would say, quite the feat. And yeah. there had been films, well respected films, well before that as well. But it's not just a passing fad or, or anything like that. It is a, a true growing industry. Yeah. Talking about Minari, obviously, you know, that's kind of recently again in the headlines because of the awards that it's up for and winning. Mm -hmm. How was your experience on that and what was your role in that? Uh, on the film Minari, I was the unit production manager. And Minari is, it was one of the, the great experiences of my life because just you know how special it was from the moment you mm -hmm. received that script. Uh, I had received a call from the uh, the executive producer and line producer, Josh Backoff. Uh, he had been here in Oklahoma a couple years prior. We had been chatting about getting another project off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Blue Oil Contusa. And uh, that very well may, may, may well be filming a little bit later on in future years here in Oklahoma, but it didn't pan out at the time. But, uh, you know, Josh and I had headed off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he uh, went back to uh, Parts Beyond to work on other projects. And then one day, uh, it was May, and I was in the parking lot of an Oklahoma City mall. And uh, Josh gives me a call and says, uh, hey, Dylan, uh, I've got this project uh, that we were supposed to shoot in Georgia. Uh, and for reasons I won't go into, but uh, there's no longer able to shoot in Georgia. And he says, what would this project look like if we shot it in Oklahoma? Uh, and you know, I talked about all the, the crew logistics, mm -hmm. uh, the gear, all that other sort of fun stuff. And I said, give me a second. I can uh, show you some photos as well. So I go into, uh, you know, thankfully, I've got a location scouting background as well. I go into my, my library. I show some photos mm -hmm. of what could potentially be beneficial to this story. They uh, pass them off to the director. Uh, the director's hooked. And in case anyone is uh, not familiar, uh, Minari is the story of uh, Lee Isaac Chung, a writer-director of his real-life story growing up in rural Arkansas. Uh, and so uh, it ended up winning out in northeastern Oklahoma, uh, believe it or not, just because of the dirt color. The farmland looked <laughs> yeah. the most like uh, Isaac's youth in Arkansas yeah. growing up. And uh, as the unit production manager, if, if folks aren't really fully aware of what that role is. You're a, very much a parental figure mm -hmm. uh, on set. Uh, I was working at a con concert with uh, Josh Backoff, uh, making sure the budget was on track, uh, helping hire all the crew, getting all the logistics, uh, making sure you have your, all your gear, any mm -hmm. problems that start to arise, you tamp yeah. them down, you're putting out fires left and right. Uh, we have a fire in the film, you're helping make sure that fire is happening. Uh, it's, it's sort of an all-encompassing, multi-hour yeah. Uh, almost seven day a week job, but uh, it's incredibly rewarding. But you love it. Oh, I'm a crazy person, and I love it. <laughs> love the chaos. <laughs> yes, <right>? absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's. I mean, that's special, right? That's that's really cool to to be to have such a big input in that. Um, you know, for for you know, okay, you're not going to be on the screen or whatever, but it doesn't matter. Your your name's still in 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 the credits, and and you know your impact in that movie, and more importantly. The people who are involved in the movie know, but maybe without you, it wouldn't have gone the way it did, which is a nice thing to have, right? And when you tell your parents that, they probably feel really proud of you. Uh, right? my, my mom <laughs> cried when she saw my name in the credits, and yeah. that was a special moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, as well, obviously, Oklahoma film industry, we have coming soon, I guess, when they start filming Killers of the Flower Moon with a massive cast list and, like mm -hmm. you said, a huge budget. Um, Tell me about tell me first about what that means for Oklahoma and Oklahoma film industry, and then we'll dive into your side of it as well. So there are uh, multiple projects uh, of considerable size happening within days of each other. Uh, they are Killers of the Flower Moon and Reservation Dogs, the okay. FX TV series. And just to know that two Titan pro level projects of that sort are happening are just an enormous uh, next stepping stone for Oklahoma. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is without a doubt the largest project that has graced Oklahoma mm -hmm. and 
many of the surrounding states. This uh, project of this size, scope, budget level just does not happen frequently. You're, you're going to have to be in a much larger market for that. Um, and But if you have infinite Apple money, that's going to help. Of course. Let's, let's be honest here. <laughs> so, but what this means for Oklahoma is uh, a potential to, to level up, because just as with, within the last, I believe, two days, a mm-hmm. fresh uh, crew call has gone out from the Oklahoma Film and Music Office saying uh, all the different craftspeople that they need mm-hmm. and just many different uh, specialties. It's a lot of people being able to get boots on the ground and see how titans of industry work. Yeah. And that is a level up opportunity for everyone. Uh, you know, Granted, not everyone's going to be able to get a job on it that they want, but so many people are going to be able to. They're going to see how the titans work mm-hmm. and then share those lessons and then help grow our industry that way yeah. and just the potential for growth in terms of people seeing what it takes to uh, do a film like that and bring that we already had pretty much most of that here but now it brings it to the next level to sure. know what the, uh, the next stage of evolution is and I feel that that's invaluable for the state yeah and I guess the titans will realize that they can rely on the people in, in this state if they're already here or they will be trained up and so, uh, right because they, they don't want to be bringing people in from LA or wherever to do the stuff. Absolutely. That is definitely happening uh, yeah. in certain instances in many departments where they are coming in. But now this will be an opportunity for these people to be here for the next kind of uh, next time because this is one mm-hmm. thing that the state's trying to focus on is that you don't necessarily want it to be a one and done. You don't yeah. just bring one flower moon here and then it's over. You uh, show Apple that, you know, we can we have what it takes to succeed Mm -hmm. and then apple's just like oh we had a good time in oklahoma we got this done we were able to do this let's bring this back yeah so in it the in the final analysis that is the the grand goal is to keep having projects Mm -hmm. come back from uh, production companies from producers that are happy and uh, again to just sort of weave in random lessons here Mm -hmm. as i chat that's another thing that i like to tell uh people that are coming up in this industry when you're working on a project it's not just the project you're working on at this moment. You can't just burn something to the ground to get yeah. something done. That is how you never work in something again. So it's not just this project. It's every project that happens afterwards. So think long term. Take mm-hmm. a 50,000-foot view and see how it is going to affect the future. And that is going to be one of your keys to success. Yeah. And and to that point, right, it, it filters down to help, you know, the, the industry, that the amount of money that the industry is bringing to the state helps look local businesses, local food, local whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's not just, you know, the production and the actors and that's it, right? It's so much more that goes on to it. Oh, absolutely. There is a symbiosis on many levels and th- I do not possess all the figures in my head and I would butcher them if I tried, but there are millions and millions of dollars uh, yeah. uh, with large projects coming in, giving back to communities and growing them mm-hmm. as well. And I, I believe that's a truly wonderful yeah. thing. So what personally kind of excites you about like the story itself and the fact that it's been, you know, shot out here? One, just the fact that it's being filmed here when they honestly probably could have done it in another state, but mm-hmm. to know it's all where the original subject material happened, that is very gratifying to know. And just as, as, a student of history as a, uh, a citizen of Oklahoma, it's, I am hesitant to use the word glad because it is such tragic, tragic subject mm-hmm. material. So I'm hesitant to say that I'm glad it's being told because it is so tragic, sure. but it is a story that desperately needs to be told and people need to know that chapter of our history. Mm-hmm. And so therefore I'm hesitant to say glad, but I'm glad that folks are going to be knowing this right. and then potentially learn a lesson and, uh, Hopefully not repeated. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, every that's one thing that that I think that you know it, it's such a like you said it, you're not glad, but like people need to know this story. Mm-hmm. They need to be educated on the past and the history because it's shaped who and what some of the things that we do, right? Uh, and absolutely. The reasons why. And, and that people part need to know that. that part of the uh, of Oklahoma has been shaped by those events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's coming here. That's I mean, it's going to be amazing for the state and 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 all the good things that will come from that. Um, what are, are you involved in that? Do you hope to be involved in it? Like, have you been had the call yet? How is uh, yes, that? Yes, uh, I was involved uh, in some of the early phases mm-hmm. of uh, Killer of the Flower Moon. There was a 
it's, we're talking in like pandemic eras now, but I was involved just a baby yeah. bit pre-pandemic. And then uh, post-pandemic, once we, we came back, uh, I was helping them get their initial world mm-hmm. uh, all set up. And then I uh, parted ways with the project uh, to come over and uh, produce on Reservation Dogs, okay. uh, which is a uh, FX, which is a Fox Disney sure. uh, subsidiary television uh, series by uh, Sterling Harjo, local filmmaker, mm-hmm. and Taika Waititi. Uh, they came up together in the Sundance Labs years ago, mm-hmm. and so they're was close as brothers yeah. and they uh, wrote the series together uh, and we did the pilot last September and then now we're shooting another seven episodes to bring up to an eight episode run yeah. uh, which will be uh, hopefully premiering later on this year on FX. That's awesome. Uh, to the point of the pandemic and how that's rocked every industry, what was that like for you? I mean, how, how, how did that stop everything or was it better for you, <laughs> I guess easier because the stuff you're working on is in the state? Believe it or not, Oklahoma sort of just blaze the trails in terms of post, not even post, current pandemic filming. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was the first uh, SAG blessed project come back after you know, the pandemic height of lockdown was happening. That was a project called um, Harvest of the Heart and it was happening in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a lot of companies realized like Oklahoma's open for business. And thankfully, you know, we had a lot of you know great minds putting in safety precautions to try to make filming as safe as possible granted it, it can't just you can't be in a perfectly mm-hmm. protected bubble but lots of uh, in, incredibly strin, uh, stringent you know, testing and PPE and uh, hand washing sanitization many mm-hmm. many uh, it's the stack is if anyone's looking at the video it's like the stack is this high just paperwork that <laughs> Very you gotta, high. <laughs> uh, gotta go through uh, just to to make sure everything's all ticked off and it allowed us to go back to work and mm. I'm not going to lie. It's it's incredibly tough, and just from a budgeting standpoint, you can spend upwards of like an additional thirty percent of what mm-hmm. you're planning on spending just in your COVID costs alone. Yeah. Uh, getting your brain poked countless times is not fun. They somehow get less terrible every time mm-hmm. you do them, uh, but it's it's not a, a great thing to do. Um, but it keeps us uh, it keeps us all working, and yeah. it, let's be honest, it's a distraction from. Uh, dreading the pandemic but uh, in this moment in time now uh, we are in phase three mm-hmm. of vaccinations uh, Oklahoma film crew is considered uh, an essential employee which is phase three so if any folks listening mm-hmm. uh, don't realize at this moment in time um, yeah. sign up get your vaccine you're eligible and uh, it's 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 truly uh, surreal to be excited about a vaccine yeah, right <laughs> but i actually am just to have that peace of mind yeah. knowing that you've fought so hard just to to stay safe right. and you try to keep your people safe keep your set safe mm-hmm. and then now that these vaccines are, are rolling out well you might not have 100 percent protection just the the level of protection that there is is mm-hmm. so invaluable to as a safety precaution yeah. it's, it's truly a good feeling especially after an incredibly tough year right because you get you know you, you're if you're exposed to it everyone's got a quarantine or mm-hmm. if one person's exposed to it they might have lose their jobs and they're replaced by someone very easily mm-hmm. if they're the, on the you know it's and that's been the grand fear for yeah. all of us is we have to keep ourselves safe because what if we get it we might not have a job when we right. come back because if especially if it's a project that's moving fast and furious you know mm-hmm. who's to say that they don't just get someone else to replace you yeah. so that has been the one of the larger uh, other than making sure that my people my my crews my family everyone is safe it mm. was the the fear just like oh no what if i'm replaced <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, in the movie industry is very easily done, I'm sure. Absolutely. Right? Uh, Okay, so I'm going to finish with two questions. Uh, One of them might be really hard. But uh, first, if you could work on any movie that's been in the past, I mean, it could be 50, 40 years old, what would it have been and why? Oh, man. I, oh, well, that's oh, not the hard one. You the devil. next one's the oh, hard you one. Devil. That's, that's a, <laughs> that is a tough question. Um, mm, okay. I... So it's probably going to be a it's going to be a couple films because mm-hmm. I'm going to have a long sure. career in this. I'm going to be using my time machine to go back and work on projects. Uh, one would be 2001: A Space Odyssey, uh, Stanley Kubrick, just to see the pioneering technology at the time. Like as an adult looking back in retrospect, like how they did things still blows my mind. Yeah. I would have loved to have been there, been a fly on the wall, you know, getting Kubrick, you know 
NFT or something mm-hmm. just to see how that was working. Uh, another project that that shaped my life incredibly was was Star Wars. That was one of the projects that really made me dream. Mm-hmm. And if I've got a time machine, I'm working on projects. I want to go work on Empire yeah, yeah. Strikes Back. Let's of be course. honest. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's be let's let's pick the one I want. Yeah. So it would be then just to see. <laughs> Just to see again all of the pioneering sure. adventures that were happening in that, and then and since I'm just picking grand adventures here yeah. as well, uh, just to see the sheer scope of a project like a Lord of the Rings, where you go and just achieve immeasurable goals yeah. uh, and on a multi-year scale, like you're shooting three movies back to back to back, yeah. just to fully comprehend how, how all of that happened as well. That would have been a grand adventure in my opinion as well. That's the three good answers. Uh, okay, so going into the future, who would you like to work with and on what kind of movie? Because I guess you wouldn't know what it would be, but what if you could go and work with some people in the oh, future, who would it be? Interesting. Okay. I have been fortunate fortunate enough to work with some truly wonderful people, but in terms of folks that I haven't gotten a chance to work with that I would love to work with, uh, I've always admired uh, Darren Aronofsky's uh, unique look at the world, you know, the fountain, uh, his uh, Requiem for a Dream pie. He's he's someone that I would love to to see work. Mm-hmm. And. Granted, the the opportunity is coming close. I didn't never got to meet the man or to see him work. I would love to see Martin Scorsese's brain work. Mm-hmm. He has one of the most encyclopedic brains I've ever seen in my entire life. Or I haven't seen his brain, yeah. but I've heard his brain. Sure. He is truly a fascinating man in terms of his capacity for cinema. Yeah. I would love uh, to see him work. Um, oh, there are so, so many folks that I would love to uh, to work with, but those are two that I would, yeah. I would be a happy man to, to work You with. also worked on The Mule, right, with Clint I, Eastwood? I did work with Mr. Clint Eastwood, How yes. was that? Because, like, I, I just, I, he fascinates me. I think he's awesome. That that was one of the, the most random adventures of my entire yeah. uh, life. It was originally uh, just supposed to be, they shot the main unit uh, mostly in Atlanta, then they did a little bit in New Mexico, and then they were going to have a five-state road trip mm-hmm. uh, uh, of Clint's character, you know, peddling, sure. uh, dr- driving drugs across yeah. the country. And one of those states was going to be Oklahoma. So I was in charge with locking down all the uh, locations in Oklahoma. We were going to drive by the Golden Driller here in mm-hmm. Tulsa. Uh, we had some rolling hills and uh, gorgeous vistas that we were going to take him by. But towards the end of filming, uh, Clint Eastwood at the time is roughly in his late 80s. Yeah. Uh, so he's, he was getting a little bit tired. And, then, and Clint just wanted to be over with the, the road trip. So in the idea then at that point was just to have the the multi-state road trip be just take place in New Mexico, Colorado, go up into um, other states if need be. Sure. And they said, uh, Dylan, um, get on a plane, you're coming to Colorado. It was so within hours I'm on a plane uh, to go to Colorado and so I am out looking for cornfields and everything that we need <laughs> yeah. uh, just to, to, to try to get all of these because we're trying to just fake the fact that it's like oh it's Illinois right. here yeah. in Colorado we're just trying to find all yeah. these cheats and all these different places so I am just driving around like a madman mm-hmm. trying to just find every unofficial mayor I can to say like do you know where I can find this do you right. know where I can find this and it's just it's a mind boggling just breakneck speed yeah. adventure and sure and then sure enough on the last few days of filming it comes to my part of the world all the different uh, locations that I found you know sure enough Clint rolls up and It's to see, other than like a zombie John Wayne or something, I don't think there's a certain portion of the population that knows an actor that much. I was dealing with a lot of farm uh, country, and there were people that were going to die happy deaths knowing that Clint Eastwood was just going to drive a truck in front of their property. And so to see him there was truly mind-boggling because, granted, he is... He's an almost 90-year-old mm-hmm. man, but you understand why he's Clint Eastwood, even as an older man. He's just like, some people have it, and that yeah. man has it. And uh, all the stories are true, how fast he shoots, uh, how professionally he is. And I was able to sort of see the dream that I wanted to have happen in the future of filmmaking in his style. Yeah. Because he has this trusted team around him, some of these folks that he's worked with for decades and, and I don't mean just like 20 years 30 yeah. years and beyond and you know he he'll do a take they'll sort of just have a quick little meeting of the minds and everything is dispersed
just immediately everyone knows what they need to do. And if mm -hmm. they didn't get it in one, which they get a lot, they get it in two. And yeah. the day just moves incredibly fast. And just to be able to work with a family that you just keep going back with and working with over and over and over again for decades, that's the dream to That's me. awesome. Well, mate, thank you for coming down. Thanks to Circle Cinema for having us. Um, I think, I mean, there's so many lessons in this in in this episode that that you've mentioned. You know, you know, hard work being the main thing. Um, and you know, if I guess to round it out, what you know, if it isn't hard work, which I'm sure it is, but if it isn't, what you know, if there's anyone listening that wants to get into the movie business, wants to get into the production side of things, you know, how would you do it? And you know, what would be like your advice? Uh, one of the great pieces of advice I would also have is is connections. Mm -hmm. You know, granted, you might you're probably looking at this in social media. Send me a message. I will point you in the right direction. But it's it's going to be connections. It's the yeah. folks that you know that might know someone. Uh, look at the rebate queue that's on the film and music office website to see the projects that are going to be coming, and then ask your friends like, "Oh, do you know about you know, let's say Reservation Dogs? Do you know any way on in on that?" And then just talk to your your contacts. You know, even if you haven't set foot on film. Mm -hmm. uh, Get, draft up some sort of resume or CV, just something saying what your passions are, what you're interested in. Yeah. Like, Grant, someone, you might not have spent a second on a film set, but if you're a hard worker, you've got a good heart, you're going to try hard, I would rather have you on my film set than someone that's just yeah. a curmudgeon and doesn't want to work and is just going to just drag their feet or sit down all day. Yeah. So you, you might not have a, a lick of experience, still send me a resume. I'll try to get you get it in front of a department that's in need mm -hmm. uh, and we'll try to get, move you up in the world yeah. that way. And it's just, it's going to be communication. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be passion. And that's what's going to move you up in the world. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. Um, for everyone listening, I'll post the links to Dylan's stuff so you can go see, check him out and reach out to him if you want to. And yeah, we'll catch you next episode. Cheers. Thank you so much. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahoma.com oklahomahof.com and follow them on instagram for daily updates at oklahoma hof also huge shout out to rcb bank for jumping on board to be a sponsor rcb bank's loan promotion is here for a limited time head into any of their 40 oklahoma locations to get as low as 1.79 apr on your next car boat camper or atv apply online at rcbbank.com rcb bank that's my bank rate and finance with approved credit restrictions apply and member fdic huge shout out to my sponsors uh, thank you for listening we'll catch you next episode cheers Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.